It started with actually watching my own dog. I think a lot of people who own pets, they watch them and they think that their animals have, got, have thoughts and emotions and are responding to them. But it, 20, 30 years ago, we were told that we were just sentimentalizing, that the animals really didn't have th thoughts of their own. They were just reacting to stimulus. Mm -hmm. So um, I watched our dog, Quincy. She was a mixed collie, and she invented various games. And I thought, it's remarkable. She has an imagination. And you see that, mm -hmm. too, when your dogs dream. You think there's something going on in their minds, or just how they look at you and study you. And then I had a, a wonderful trip that I made, too. Uh, East Africa to Tanzania to meet with Jane Goodall and mm. to interview her about Louis Leakey who had started her on her research there. Mm. So mm. while I was there with Jane we watched the chimpanzees together and, and I, let's pull up a photo of that. Sure. There she yeah, is. There with, she is. Yeah, with the that chimpanzee. was when I was with uh, Jane at Gombe National Park oh. in Tanzania. It was uh, a fabulous experience, obviously, to first be meeting with Jane Goodall and then to be watching Jane Goodall watching the chimpanzees. So, uh, of course, we saw a number of behaviors there that made one really question what was going on in the mind of the chimpanzee. Right. In one particular incident, this older chimpanzee was caring for an orphan chimp, and we watched uh, as Jane had given him a big bunch of bananas, which we had thought he would share with the little orphan Dilly, but he didn't. He sat down, and <laughs> I know it was really something to watch this big, beefy guy just sit there and eat about 30 bananas all by himself, and little Dilly was sitting there looking sadder and sadder and more deflated. And so afterwards, he fell on his back and was snoring. Going the big chimp that I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Beethoven sound asleep, snoring. Dilly was grooming him. And Jane was standing in the shed next to where this little drama was unfolding, and she'd held back one banana because she thought Beethoven might pull that stunt. And she held the banana up so Dilly could see it, and she and Dilly made eye contact. And it was as if a thought passed between mm -hmm. the two of them. And Normally, a chimpanzee, when they see food, they make a food cry. Mm. And so that was what Beethoven had done when he mm -hmm. saw the bananas. He made mm. this hoo-hoo-hoo sound. But uh, Dilly didn't make a peep. She was so mm. smart enough to not, not make a sound. And so that, you'd say, okay, the banana is a stimulus. She should make the response of a food cry. But she is a thinking animal, and she didn't. Mm. And so she watched as Jane put the banana behind the shed out of sight of Beethoven, and little Dilly very quietly tiptoed over there, got the banana, ate it in about two bites, and then tiptoed back to Beethoven, making these very soft contentment sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I was amazed by that, and I said to Jane afterwards, I said, that was truly remarkable, and aren't you going to write that up for a scientific journal about how this young chimpanzee, you know, sort of plotted with you and deceived Beethoven? And she said, oh, I, I absolutely can't. Why? This, this was in 1985. I mean, it's really not that long ago. And she, and she said, well, if I do, people will accuse me of anthropomorphizing. I see. I can't possibly say that Dilly deceived Beethoven uh -huh. or that Dilly plotted with me. I can only say, if Dilly were a human, we would say yes. she did X, Y, Z, because it's intentional behavior rather right. than stimulus response. Right. It actually requires thinking. Right. And at that time, scientists were really prohibited by the way that the science of animal behavior had come about from actually saying that animals did things with purpose or intention. It was only that, you know, you, know, you sort of hit them on the knee and they responded. It wasn't, didn't require any brain power. So, but she told me, she said, and she, Jane was very wise and smart. She <laughs> is a very wise woman. She said, but the field is changing. Mm, she could feel it already. She knew that it was changing. And so she said, in time, it's going to be very different. And I thought that would be my next book. That was 1985. Oh, even then you thought even, that? Yes, I thought that's a transition that I want to uh, watch and chronicle. And so when I finished the book, then I began to work on articles that were about animal behavior and animal cognition research, and eventually uh, received a, an assignment from National Geographic magazine to write a story about that subject. Mm -hmm. That was in 2006. And I think maybe there's a photo related to that. There is. <laughs> we can ask yeah. for that to come up. Yeah, there is, I think, the cover shot of, yes, yes there, it, there is. it is. Inside Animal Minds. That was my 
uh, came out in March 2008. It was a cover story for National Geographic, and it was hugely popular. I think partly because of the lovely photograph of Betsy the Border Collie yes. <laughs> on the cover. Now, was that your dog? No, no, oh. that was the dog in Austria, and she's a very smart dog, and she's one of these dogs that the owners, just as a game, because uh, Betsy was really attuned to words and so forth, and they had as a game, they had taught her how each toy had a different name. She had about 350 toys, mm. each one with a different name, and you could put all her toys out there and tell her to go get uh, like the hamburger, and which was of course a rubberized mm. looking ha chew toy hamburger, and, and Betsy would go and out of all of her other toys, she would get that one.